It's a little weird for me to be up talking to all of you experts about excellence in teaching. Uh, I think we can all learn from each other, and I, I really do appreciate all you do. Uh, and how about your keynote speaker, Steve? Give him another hand. Steve, thank you. I told President Cockett when I joined the team here that uh, one of the reasons I was interested in Utah State University is because I am uh, pretty much my entire life, uh, I've been uh, since I was a little kid with the green, you know, the green clover and doing my 4-H, I've been a land-grant rat my whole life. Uh, I love the land-grant system. I love the idea of the land-grant university being a ladder instead of a ceiling. And that's the ladder that you all provide through your educational activities across the board. Um, I think Steve made the point that the, uh, that the land grant mission, as you know, is the three-legged stool as we talk about it, which is uh, uh, teaching and learning, outreach and engagement, extension, and research and discovery. And the really cool thing is what a good land grant university such as Utah State University can do is maintain that focus on linking those three. Uh, you, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten just, just very recently, before I joined Utah State University, I really started to pay more attention to the national uh, conferences in undergraduate research. And the thing I noticed when I was there is there are an awful lot of USU students running around there. And it got me to thinking, you know, Utah State University, uh, among the land grants, does a fantastic job of doing world-class research in response to state needs, world needs, addressing those grand challenges. But the really cool thing is students and teachers are involved in much of what we do. And I, I'm pretty excited about that. The same goes for uh, our extension outreach work. Uh, to the extent we can take this information and translate it uh, for the public or other constituents, isn't it great that our students are doing a lot of that? Uh, industrial opportunities and engineering. We have students from business that are down, you know, working with CEOs of major corporations in the Wasatch. Um, those are the kinds of connections that we need to continue to pay lots of attention to as educators. Now, uh, uh, it, so, so, so that, that forms the basis of what I think about uh, every day, really, is what happens in the classroom is critical to the success of our students. You know, Robert and I have talked about our part, you know, Robert mentioned our partnership. Uh, and, and it's really cemented as, as Robert focuses so much on the student journey in terms of uh, obviously your efforts as uh, developing teachers, but also in those areas uh, such as recruitment of students and then you know, getting them completed. And, and, and where we overlap and we work so well together is in that academic experience that the student has that you all provide and then certainly the advising the students receive. Students, if, they're, if they feel that their teacher or their mentor is responsive to them in the classroom and gives them a meaningful experience, uh, they, they're more likely to finish. Uh, I saw some data, and I'm not going to quote it, and I'm not going to use numbers because I'm sure I'll have it wrong, and then Steve will throw something at me. So, uh, but, but I do know that a student who has gone through one significant, high-impact, high-touch practice in their career is more likely to finish. And those students who have had one of those, one, one of those experiences, uh, excuse me, those students have had two of those experiences uh, are much more, not just more, much more likely to succeed and, and finish. And isn't that what we're about? We're, we, we should be a ladder. If you look at, okay, we've got Utah State University. We focus on those students, you know, the working class, that middle class student, who, who really can benefit from an excellent research-based, high-quality education. You contrast that with, the, uh, with, with, with some of the other, I won't say who they are, other units, even in Utah, that just basically want the students enrolled. But they don't pay attention necessarily to how they, how they graduate, what their graduation rates are, uh, where they land when they finish. Uh, why is a land-grant university, in terms of our access mission, different from uh, any other four-year state college or community college? What are we doing different? We have that research. We have that extension. We have that expertise. And you know what? We make that available to our students. And that's wonderful. And that's what I see as teaching excellence. But teaching excellence goes deeper. It goes to what you all do every day in your classrooms. And what I hope we're doing through this conference and other efforts and ETE and AIS and, and congratulations to 
Travis, Neil, I'm going to miss somebody, Robert, John, Aaron. Uh, that team really works hard to get you all both the strategy, strategic tools and the computer tools, the technological tools, to do your job. And not only do your job, but be excellent. And, and good for you for all being here. What, 450 registered? Is that right, Travis? Just over 400. Give yourselves a big hand because you are a part of continuous improvement. You're the reason our students are succeeding. I appreciate your work to improve the value of your teaching as you go through, through these kinds of efforts. Um, I can tell you now I've been through a cycle of, of looking at faculty promotions, uh, those issues. And you know, one of the things I've noticed and, and, and what I think is really neat about Utah State University is as I listen to comments and read letters and whatnot, one of the things that's truly valued for our teachers are efforts to improve their teaching, and that is recognized. You know, we all start somewhere. I even had one, one dossier I was looking at, excellent teacher. Teacher did a great job and had a dip. And it turned out it was well explained. That dip was because she was trying something different. Oh, goodness. We're supposed to innovate, but then we get punished for innovating? Please understand that at least at my level, and I'm sure at John and Robert's level, and when I visit with department heads, we want to encourage innovation. We don't want to hurt our students. But try stuff. Get feedback. Take that feedback. Implement it. Keep going. And the other thing I'd say is as you look at your curriculum, look at your syllabus, and think, boy, I'd love to be able to do these new high-impact things and, and provide more research space or flip my classroom. You don't have to do it all at once. Uh, we're busy. You've got other, you've got many roles. You're mentors, you're teaching graduate students, you're doing research, you're doing extension. Um, as you look at trying to, you know, upgrade your class, don't just think about new information, but maybe just take a little piece of it. They call it small teaching, and there's a great book written on that. Um, just upgrade a bit of it each year. Uh, we did a workshop a number of years ago, and I was involved in um, my, my, my spouse actually led the conversation, but it was really cool. Um, uh, we, we had faculty members come in, and they each took one little tiny piece of one of their, one of their many courses, and they tried to, you know, tried to flip it, tried to do something innovative with it, and that one little bit made such a huge difference, and so many of them started to evolve. Now, we had a couple of like type A, triple A people who decided they were going to flip their whole class, and one of them actually succeeded in doing it. The next year, the students creamed him, and now he's back to being considered, you know, award-level teaching. Uh, but, you know, what good fun it is, because, you know, we're in this business not just to teach, but to innovate and to get to know our students and to support our students. So, you know, be bold within reason, um, but be bold. Try these new things. Don't do it all at once. Don't be too hard on yourself, but just continuously work on your teaching. And that's what I see here. And, and continuously reaching out and providing those high-touch contact moments with your students because that's what helps them to succeed. Now, a couple things about general education. Um, how many of you teach gen ed courses? There's a number of hands up there. How many of you are teaching courses that might be gen ed, but you don't know they're gen ed courses? <laughs> Try to find out. Um, it, you know, general education gets, you know, the breadth classes, composition, um, uh, the quantitative skills, they get a bad rap sometimes among students. But if we really think about it, our 1,000, 2,000 level classes ought to be our top priority. Uh, if you get students started along the right way, they will finish. If you are among the group in here who do teach gen ed courses, take a minute, step back, and remind those students once in a while why they're taking the course. Why are we here? Well, I can give you an 80,000-foot level view, and that is from the National Academy of Sciences. For all of you in engineering and science out there in the hardcore STEM, why do we bother with composition crowd? Um, when I talk to CEOs of co companies such as Monsanto, Martin Marietta, uh, one of the things I consistently hear is they value a great land-grant education in their students. Matter of fact, they value what we do enough that they assume that a student with a degree, a legitimate bachelor's, master's, PhD from a land-grant such as Utah State University has the skills they're looking for. That's not what they interview on. They want to know when they talk to that student to get in that last step, 
Can you communicate? Can you work in teams? Do you have a global orientation? You know, many of these companies are multinationals. Um, if they're not multinational, they're destined to do so. Uh, I had one of my students uh, a number of years ago, and I'll kind of finish with this story and then, and then just make a couple other points. But this student came from a, basically just a very, very poor, small farmer over in eastern Wyoming. And, uh, and he came into college, and he was going to take plant sciences. And he was kind of, you know, he took his writing. He had to. He got through his math because he had to do it to pass his biology class. And, and you know, biology went pretty well for him, so he was doing all right. And uh, we bumped into him in the, in the hall one day. I said, hey, have you, we had a, an arrangement with a, with a European institute. and said, have you ever thought about doing a global experience? And he goes, really? Why would I ever want to go to Europe? I mean, they're different. I said, yeah, probably a good idea to go figure out what they're doing, don't you think? Well, I can't afford it. Well, I had a donor who I'd been working with who gave me a million dollars to endow a program to send students like that for a global experience. And my rule was a round-trip ticket. We did want them back, so I didn't buy them one-way tickets. Maybe a few. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, a round-trip ticket. This is one of the high-impact practices. Uh, the student went over. Uh, he, first, he went home and told his daddy he was going to Paris for a month. And his dad says, it's hot in Texas. Why are you bothering? I said, no, no, no. He was talking about France. So he went over to France, had a life-changing experience, did, an, did a follow-up internship in Saudi Arabia. Or no, uh, Egypt. Excuse me. Went to work just like his fat folks wanted to, ag, ag business. Went to work for a small trucking, Midwestern trucking firm. One day, the, 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 the owner of that firm pulled this young man in, this, all of his employees, all 200, in and said, how many of you have been overseas? And he looked around, his, his was the only hand in the air from the University of Wyoming, from a small farm in eastern Wyoming. He says, fine. He said, I need to open an operation in China. You're doing it. Bye. And so he went over. He now runs the largest long-haul chucking firm in China. He's the only, the only Westerner in the company over there. He has 3,000 native employees over there. And he did that because he's a smart guy, he was well-educated at a land grant, and he had had a high-impact experience. That is an N of one, and I, I hate to tell you, and I love to tell you, that that's what we do, one student at a time, one student success, and it may be one of your students, it may be one of your staff, uh, it, it, that's what we do at a land-grant university. So uh, let, let me wrap up with, with another just great point. We are not just teaching undergraduate students. We have graduate education. And that's an important thing, too. And a lot of us, I was one of them, came out of the research lab and went straight into the classroom. I had no clue what to do in the classroom. So for those of you who are training your graduate students and you have a clue that, that they just might, especially PhD students, land in a faculty position, give them an opportunity to teach. Pass a little of that along. You know, just a little bit of just, hey, it's a big world out there. Here's some things you can try. Maybe let them guest lecture, you know, help them out in the lab a little bit. It'll make a huge difference, and then you're paying it forward. So with that, um, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, everything you're doing here. Remember, I, I'll close with this. You're, you're going to learn a lot of great techniques in your breakout sessions here. You're going to see a lot of neat stuff out um, in, in the lobby here in a minute. Uh, but just remember, there's lots of tools. Uh, John Louvier is, is, Louvier is, is recognized nationally for his ability to get those great tools to help you teach in your hands. But don't feel like you have to use every single, every single one of them. I can't even pronounce most of them. I can't even remember most of them. But pick those ones that look like they make sense for you and your students. And then work with John and Travis and Robert and Aaron and their team and, and figure out how that best works for you. You pick and customize what works best for you, and you'll be a tremendous success, which you already are. So thanks. Keep doing what you do. Good luck for the rest of your conference. And uh, again, uh, please give a big hand to our AIS team uh, for their, their work this, this week.